Um, first, I'd like to thank the organizers. Um, I've really enjoyed the seminars that I've been able to attend so far. So if some of the other speakers are out there, thank you as well. Um, it's, been, it's been fun. So today um, I'm gonna speak on some joint work with Clara Aldana and Klaus Kirsten. Um, let's see if I can, oh, okay, here we go. So a little intro, hi, I'm, uh, I did my undergraduate at the University of Washington. I had a supervisor, Stefan Roda, and um, did my PhD at Stanford with the supervision of Rafe Maceo. And since 2015, I've been in Sweden um, and I'm at Chalmers University, which has a joint department with the University of Gothenburg. So I'm sort of in two places at the same time, but it's really just the same place. Um, so my co-authors are Clara, who's in Colombia, and Klaus Kirsten, who's in uh, Michigan. And so what are we interested in here? Well, to quote Stephen Hawking, um, the zeta function can be applied to calculate the partition functions for thermal gravitons and matter quanton black holes, which sounds really cool. Um, and it's an example of what I like to say is that physics is just math with cooler words. Um, I don't actually understand what this means. So if anyone does and they would like to enlighten me, uh, that would be great. But the point is, is that there's a lot of interest, not just from pure mathematics, also from physics to understand uh, the zeta regularized determinant. So we could define the determinant of the Laplacian as the product of the eigenvalues. Does, does anyone have a problem with this? No, that's okay. I mean, I guess the non-zero <laughs> ones. Smiles. Pardon? I guess the non-zero ones. Uh, yeah, but I, I think that's not really going to be really converging, right? Yeah. So this, this would blow up rather badly. So, so we don't really want to do that. Um, so I'll, I'll define these things a bit more rigorously in a moment, but just to put it into context, we're going to consider surfaces that can have isolated cone points and also smooth boundary components, as well as curvy linear polygonal domains. So those can have actual boundary that meets a corner, not, not just an isolated singularity, but corners. Um, and those include circular sectors and then also finite cones. So in all of these geometric settings, um, the eigenvalues of the Laplacian behave asymptotic. So lambda n is up to a constant factor growing like n. Okay. So if we go back to that expression, we see, um, yeah, that's not, that's not going to converge. <laughs> but the way we're going to define the determinant is via the spectral zeta function, which is defined by taking all of the eigenvalues, raising them to the power of minus s and adding them up. Um, of course, we don't do this with the zero eigenvalue in case um, the in case there is a zero eigenvalue. Um, we will always be considering Friedrich's Laplacian and in two dimensions this coincides with the Dirichlet extension. So here's a little exercise. It's quite elementary. The zeta function can be equivalently represented via the trace of the heat kernel. Um, And so with the preceding exercise, with this expression, we can rigorously define the determinant as e to the minus zeta prime at zero. This is still a little dodgy because if we look at the sum which defines the zeta function, lambda k is growing kind of like k. And so it will converge when s is greater than one or the real part of s is greater than one since s can be complex. So it's not really obvious that it converges when s is zero because it looks like you're adding up a bunch of ones. So now the utility of PowerPoint has been exhausted and we need to get more serious. It's time to go get more technical. Does anybody have any questions at this point? All right, so 
Okay, so the type of conical singularities that we want to allow here are what I would call non-exact. So basically, you have a smooth, a surface, which if we view it topologically, it's smooth and it has a smooth boundary. When we look at the Ramanian metric structure, um, there are these points, which are called cone points. And at those points, the Ramanian metric is asymptotic to like a perfect cone. So you see these W or omega i of R, these are metrics on the link. Since we're in two dimensions, the link of the cone is just a circle. So we have these, this family of metrics on the circle. And as we approach the cone, these can sort of vary. And then they have a, a limiting metric at the cone tip. And so this would include, of course, an exact cone. So we have the conical singularity at the top in this picture. And then you have a smooth boundary component, which is the circle at the bottom. Um, and so we define the angle to be the angle that we obtain from the limiting metric at the conical singularity. Any questions? Okay. So, so now let's get to what we mean by a curvy linear polygonal domain in a surface. It pretty much is what it sounds like. Um, you have a piecewise smooth boundary and then finitely many points where the boundary tends towards a corner. But again, it doesn't have to be sort of straight. It can kind of wave along and it is just asymptotically approaching a straight corner, but never actually becomes flat. That's all this definition really means. Um, we don't allow cusps. So, nope. but we do allow sort of phantom vertices where the angle could be pi, for instance. Again, any questions? Okay. Hey, and by the way, I wanted to add to um, all the participants, if you're shy about asking questions, because you're worried that it might sound silly, you can write it to me in the chat privately and I won't say who you are. I will just say there's a anonymous question and then try to answer it. So if you're shy, feel free to do that. Okay, so here is an example. Julie, may I ask a question? Sure. Um, so your, your domain, the, Examples of your domains are polygons in the plane, uh, but would you allow something like a rectangle with a slit, so-called barrier billiard? Um, no, I would not allow a rectangle with a slit. Okay, but polygons are okay. Yes, and they can be, um, like I said, they can be sort of curvy. The, the, the edges never actually have to get straight. Okay, thanks. And regarding the cone angle, I believe our cone angles are only up to 2 pi. Um, I got a question about the cone angles that we allow. So I don't think we want them to be greater than 2 pi. Um, okay, so Right, so a sector is an example where we have one straight exact corner, but then we have these two other corners which are never exactly straight, but yet they have a well-defined angle and that's pi over two. Um, let me see if we have another question.
Okay. Not really a technical question. So, um, so here's a picture of a sector. And okay, so let's go back to the zeta regularized determinant. We had this exercise, which was to prove that you can express the zeta function as the sum you'll recognize as the trace of the heat kernel. And in case the Laplacian has non-zero kernel, it's the trace of the heat kernel minus the projection onto the kernel of the Laplacian. So we take away the zero, um, the zero eigenvalue if, if zero is an eigenvalue. For sectors, for instance, since we have the Dirichlet boundary condition, or as long as there is at least one smooth boundary component, then of course the kernel of the Laplacian is just zero. So how we obtain the regularity of this function when s is equal to zero is we split up the integral into small t and big T. And then we use the fact that in all of the settings uh, we're considering here, the heat trace has a small time asymptotic expansion. So the part where we integrate from one to infinity has this one over gamma, which is an entire function. And so that part is totally fine and smooth, smooth at s equals zero, it's entire. The part from zero to one, when you pop in these little powers of t, you're just integrating you know, t to some power involving s and minus one, minus a half, et cetera. And so then you just integrate that. Simple as, simple as that, really. And so then you obtain, because you have this happy one over gamma of s in front, that vanishes simply at s equals zero. So the one over s that you can get from integrating these powers of t gets killed by the simple zero of the one over gamma. Does that make sense? And so in the end, the whole thing is nice and holomorphic when s is zero. So we can indeed take the derivative. And formally, if you write down the derivative of the series defining the spectral zeta function, and then you take e to the minus derivative at zero, you would get the product of the eigenvalues. Um, the product doesn't make sense, but e to the minus zeta prime of zero is perfectly well defined. Any questions about how that works? Okay, so let's continue. All right, so the first result we obtain is basically when you have a surface which just has conical singularities and no boundary, and our conformal factors are smooth up to the cone points. And what it says is when we consider this family of metrics, then the way minus log debt of the Laplacian, that is just zeta prime. That's just zeta prime at s equals zero. So the way this depends on the conformal factor is given by this expression on the right side. And so we see here the scalar curvature minus one divided by the area, which is coming from the projection onto the kernel, because when there's cone points but no boundary, the kernel of the Laplacian consists of the constant functions. So we subtract that. And then we have these angle contributions where the gamma i's are the cone angles. And the phi zero dot is the derivative of the conformal factor with respect to the parameter u um, that varies. So we have a family of conformal factors which is parameterized by u ranging from minus epsilon to plus epsilon. So this is how the determinant depends upon that. So the next thing we obtain is a so-called integrated formula. And that expresses the difference between the, let's say we start with the metric G and then we're conformally changing it um, around a conformal factor phi zero and then in the direction of some function 
eta. So our factors look like phi zero plus u times eta. And then u is ranging from minus epsilon to plus epsilon. And so this tells us the difference between the log of the determinant um, for H zero and the log of the determinant for the metric G. Any questions so far? So next, we want to allow both cone points and boundary components. And when we do that, we pick up a couple of extra terms. Um, so this is the curvature along the boundary. And this is the normal derivative of our conformal factor. Uh, sorry, the normal derivative of <laughs> the derivative of the conformal factor with respect to that parameter, um, parameterizing our one parameter family of conformal factors. So similarly, we can also obtain the integrated formula. When the conformal factors look like you have one smooth function and then you're adding a small scalar multiple of another function. So you're sort of varying in the direction of eta. And so we see some of the same terms here, the angle contribution and the scalar curvature. Um, since the kernel is empty, there is no longer that one divided by the area term, which came from the projection onto the kernel. But instead we have two contributions, sorry, Yes, two contributions from the boundary. So we also obtain the analogous formula for curvy linear polygonal domains, which could be either in the plane or in a surface. If they're in the plane, then the curvature here will be zero. Um, but if they're in a surface, it need not be zero. Um, and the integrated Polyakov formula, which expresses the difference between the two determinants. Um, and so now we're going to get to the part where we have the same, same, but different. Um, has anyone, have, have people heard that expression before? Same, same, but different? So a co-author of mine told me this expression and her explanation was when she was somewhere in Southeast Asia, walking around, they were trying to sell, people were selling like knockoff Louis Vuitton or whatever um, fancy brand, you know, items. And they were saying, same, same, but, but different. <laughs> and this is how they described the knockoff, you know, Louis Vuitton handbag. So I kind of, I thought it was a cute expression for things that are the same, but, but not. Um, and actually a funny random side note, in Hong Kong, I bought a knockoff of a fancy brand handbag and I have the same fancy brand handbag from the actual fancy brand. And do you know which of the two has lasted longer? The knockoff. The original fell apart. So same, same, but different. And which one is better is up to debate. In our case, we have this variational formula for a sector and here we assume that the angle is not of the form pi over 2n for, it's just because the formula will look different when it's, of, when it's of that type. And so the variation with respect to the angle is given by this sum of all of these terms. 
Um, and let's see if I have a question here. So let me explain. Uh, this, is, this is due to joint work with Clara Aldana. And if you look at that joint work, you'll see that the expression looks slightly different. And that's because we have been able to somewhat simplify the expression in that work. So notice here that this term, which has a sine of pi squared divided by alpha, if alpha is of the form pi divided by an integer, can anyone tell me what happens to this? Yeah, it goes away, bye-bye. So in that case, our expression simplifies to this kind of cuter version below. Oh, does everyone know what this gamma E is? It's called the euler mascheroni constant. And it's, I believe it's the derivative of the gamma function at a certain point. In any case, you can look it up, euler mascheroni constant. Okay, so this is the formula that Claire and I obtained. Um, and I'll mention, I'll, I'll say some more about how, how we obtained this. It was quite a lot of work in essence, because when you want to change the angle of, of, a, of a sector, to express this in terms of a conformal transformation, your conformal factor must be singular. You cannot use a smooth conformal factor to do this. I mean, you can prove that. So the conformal factor has to actually be singular at, if we're going like this, and this is the origin say, your conformal factor has to behave like log of r when r goes to zero. So you kind of have to rebuild the wheel, basically. Um, there's a, a large number of technical difficulties, but uh, we were able to deal with those and obtain the formula. Now, on the other hand, um, in the present work with Klaus Kirsten and Clara, we obtained this formula. And this is again for the variation of the determinant when we change the angle of the sector. Okay, so same, same, but different, right? I don't, I don't think these look particularly the same. I don't think it's obvious that this and this are the same. But indeed, um, we proved that they are. So our last results concern um, cones, as I showed in the picture. So now we have a finite cone, and we want to change the cone angle. So on the one hand, um, our sort of microlocal analysis method yields this formula. And on the other hand, our sort of mathematical physics style approach yields this formula. And again, these are actually equal for all alpha in the range um, considered. Any questions? Um, oh. I have a question, Julie. Yes. Um, concerning the smoothness assumption in your first set of theorems. Mm -hmm. um, so you, these functions phi. Mm -hmm. So you're assuming they're smooth on the on the, sort of on the smooth manifold M, right? So mm -hmm. where you where you sort of don't blow up the cone points. So so you have well defined values at the cone points, right? Is that exactly. is that correct? Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, and you say for for this angular variation, you need non smoothness, like in the sense of blow up, like logarithm of r. Mm -hmm. But you also could have a different sense of non smoothness, namely that the limits from different directions exist but are different. So it would sort of be smooth on the blown up space which would be kind of a natural thing to think about anyway, since your metric is smooth on the blown up space. Um, so do you know what happens then? I haven't thought about it, but um, I think, 
we might be able to obtain with our same methods the formula. Um, here's, here's kind of how that would work. We, we need to prove that when you multiply the conformal, um, the derivative of the conformal factor with respect to the parameter on which it depends, uh, when you take the product of that with the heat kernel, that there's an expansion for small times, um, that the trace of that will have an expansion for small times. And I think mm -hmm. if it's nice on the blown up space, mm -hmm. we may still have that. But the, yeah, the formula would look different because here we have done this for a specific fee, right? No, it would be, it would refer to your previous theorems, the ones before that, uh, where you don't vary the angle, uh, but you multiply by a conformal factor, which does not blow up at the cone points, but rather is, you know, have, has different limiting values from different directions. Mm. So like in, the, in your last term here with the sum i equals one to m, the phi mm. zero of pi would not be defined. It would, you know, it, you know the, at pi, you could have different values depending on from which direction you approach pi. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. I'd have to, I'd have to think more about it. And okay, that. Just, yeah, just a suggestion, thank you. But I would, I, I appreciate it very much because it would be, it's interesting to think about. That's one of the reasons I like giving talks is <laughs> because people raise interesting ideas which could be further explored. So Daniel, right? Yeah. Thank you. And Julie, may I ask yes. something uh, a little less technical? Um, do you have an application in mind for these formulas, like uh, extremal points of the of the determinant or something like that? Um, yes, we we do. So one kind of dream would be to try to understand, for example, compactness of isospectral sets for these non-smooth cases. Right, so one of the big applications of the fabulous um, and famous work of Osgood Phillips and Sarnak was to be able to say that um, it was like a com it's like a compactness res result for smooth surfaces that are isospectral. Um, so we could dream of something sort of sort of like quantifying how many curvilinear polygonal domains can be isospectral. Can we quantify that in some way? That would be uh, a, a dream of an application, really. I don't know how to do that yet. <laughs> okay, but this, you don't have it yet, but it's conceivable that this will be used for something of the sort. Yes, and we've also, we also are interested in um, studying, uh, and Clara and I have started this as well, um, the determinant on actual precise polygonal domains, um, um, I mean with straight edges, and possibly understanding extremals in, in that case. When you I just think, perturb the, let's say, perturb a triangle, uh, keep it being a triangle, but, uh, mm -hmm. but look at the extreme of the determinants among triangles, something yeah. like that. Um, and I should mention that in the joint work with Clara um, in the Journal of Geometric Analysis, where we obtained um, this formula. We proved that among all rectangles, the determinant is rectangles, sorry, with unit area. Of course, you normalize by area usually. Um, all rectangles with unit area, the square has the maximal determinant. And when the rectangle collapses, the determinant tends to zero. Um, that turned out to be very fun because you can express the determinant explicitly using the Dedekind eta function and so it turns into the world of number theory a little bit and we dug up some paper by Hardy and Ramanujan um, which played a really important role in the proof. Um, okay, thank you. Can I also ask something? So you uh, exclude the angles of the form pi over two n. No, uh, no, no. The form... we don't. 
that's just this this equation is not correct if it's pi over 2n if it's pi over 2n then it falls into the this case pi over oh, j mm -hmm. and so it's it's it it becomes this thing <laughs> ah okay so the second if sort of excludes the okay thank you okay so let's get into the ingredients in the proof. And um, this is actually a really good cookbook. It's um, the Silver Palette Cookbook, just in case anybody's curious. So in the case where the conformal factor is smooth, we can just sort of um, differentiate everything in the sense that we want to take the derivative with respect to u, and then we have this quantity that involves an integral. Um, so moving the derivative inside, you know, would normally be kind of dodgy, right? But because of the smoothness of the conformal factor, it's fine the derivative can come on inside and the projection onto the kernel is the same within the whole family. So that part isn't changing. So then we can differentiate the trace and here, right here, um, is where it's really important that we're in two dimensions because when you differentiate the Laplace operator, with respect to the changing of the conformal factor, you have this nice um, relationship that only holds in two dimensions. So what we can then do is we obtain this expression and then right here, we use the heat equation because you see you have Laplacian, when you take the derivative with respect to the formal factor, um, you obtain the Laplacian here and it's hitting the heat kernel and the heat kernel satisfies you know, the heat equation. And so you can rewrite this as a time derivative. And then you can integrate by parts. And that's exactly what happens right here. And integrating by parts is so crucial because it allows this little s right here to pop out in front and now you have a double pole or not double pole a double zero you have second order vanishing at s equals zero and this is the reason i would say why the variation of the determinant is sort of easier than the determinant itself because the variation is actually local, whereas the determinant is global. And because of that locality, we um, can obtain these Polykov formulas by sort of adding up the contributions from the different pieces. So the interior, boundary, cone points, etc. And in the case of curvy linear domains and surfaces, um, we, we use joint work with um, Medit Narsultanov and David Schur. Um, is David here? If David's here, hi. Um, I think Medit is not here because Medit's in Australia and I believe it's like some terrible hour of the day in Australia, but if Medit's here, then hi. <laughs> um, so we, we constructed the heat kernel in that context, and then we can use it right here to obtain all of the different contributions in this formula. And they basically come by taking this trace, looking at its expansion, and plucking off the constant term. Questions? Sorry, could you say again sort of what part of the argument goes through dimension two? 
Um, just back a few slides. The... This part. It's when we take the derivative of the Laplacian. Taking the derivative of the Laplacian with respect to changing the conformal um, factor. So it's kind of a cool exercise, um, which I've done <laughs> to understand. So you write it out, you know, you write it out by definition of Laplacian is the sum, you know, uh, well, with a minus in front and then one over square root determinant of the metric and then, you know, dig upper ij and um, another derivative and then another determinant. So in two dimensions, exactly because it's two dimensions and you have a two by two matrix sort of, um, when you differentiate this operator, you just sort of get the operator back and like a two. Um, you get this. <laughs> so, yeah, so. no, I, I, I can see now sort of how that would pop out, but it wasn't clear the first time. But it's fun to do the exercise because you see when you write it out, you know, by definition of your Romanian metric and your Laplacian associated, that exactly when it's the two by two that this happens. And when it's any other dimensions, it's gross. This is not, this doesn't look like this. It looks yicky. I hope, did I answer that, Hadrian? Yeah, thank you so much. Sure. Okay, so as I said, for the case of circular sectors, it's, it takes way more work to, to prove the formula, um, but that's done in, a, in, in, and I think Clara's here too, so hi, hi Clara. That's done in our, in our other paper. Hi, Julie. <laughs> if you're curious about that, you can read about it and, um, we can answer questions as well. Okay, so now let's go to like the math physics uh, approach. So some of you may have already thought of this, that, well, if we're dealing with a sector, we can write down um, the eigenvalues, right? The eigenvalues of a sector just come from the squares of the zeros of the Bessel functions. So, we therefore, so this base zeta function you see is the spectral zeta function for the base or the link of, of a sector. You can view a sector as a cone over an interval. And so then the link of the cone is your interval. And so, um, and your interval is of length equal to the angle of the cone, or sorry, of the sector. Um, because when the radius is one, which we're assuming here, um, the arc length is equal to the uh, angle in you know, radian measures. So this is the zeta function of that interval. And here we have the Riemann zeta function. And then you need another zeta function, which is called a Barnes type zeta function. And, um, the derivative of the zeta function is zero can be expressed in terms of these two zeta functions. So it's the derivative of the Barnes zeta function at zero, and then all this other stuff. <laughs> um, so this part here is straightforward to compute and gives you this stuff down here. And then this guy um, is computed by Klaus. Klaus figured this out. And this is exactly what one obtains. And then if you differentiate this expression here, you can see here's alpha in various places. Just naively take the derivative with respect to alpha and this is perfectly fine, well-behaved, smooth. So you just differentiate the thing with respect to alpha and you'll obtain the formula that I showed uh, some slides earlier. Okay, so 
um, for a finite cone, you can compute the eigenvalues explicitly as well. Um, I didn't say it before, but you know, you separate variables and, and there you go. And when you do that, what you get is basically on the cone, the, um, you're gonna get multiplicity two. And so what you're gonna get is twice. So if the cone angle is two alpha, then the zeta function for that cone is twice the zeta function for the sector with angle alpha plus this other zeta function looking kind of thing. And since we know that these two are holomorphic near s equals zero, we obtain the same fact for this guy. And so then to compute the derivative at s equals zero, we just need to compute the derivative of this function at s equals zero. What is lambda L naught? Um, that, those are the zeros of the Bessel function of order zero. Okay, thanks. Sure. Yeah, so it kind of looks like a scary thing because, you know, zeros of Bessel functions, you don't really have explicit ways of writing them down, but, um, and this is apparently zero angular momentum, according to the physics. So <laughs> the book is, um, Klaus has a book called uh, Spectral Functions in Mathematical Physics. That's what I'm calling the book here. So according to the book, this function can be expressed as an integral and the contour here doesn't matter. Um, this equivalent expression below is what we use. So with this expression for this function, which is kind of cool because here you have the modified Bessel function of the first type and it came from the modified Bessel function of, of no, the non-modified Bessel function, just the regular old Bessel function. So it's a kind of cool relationship between these. And so having this Bessel function here, we can use its properties to, to compute. And, and this is what we get. So we get an explicit formula for the derivative of the zeta function for the cone in terms of the derivative for the zeta function of the sector. And then this, this part, which doesn't depend on the angle at all, it's the same. Um, so when we, do the variation with respect to the angle, this is going to go away. And so we get that the derivative or the variation with respect to the angle, the cone, is simply obtained by the angular variation, the sector of half the cone angle. So you just take our formula for the sector and you plug in alpha over two instead of alpha. Okay, so let's, so I'm gonna start with the angles of the form pi over j. And we had <laughs> this formula, uh, which Clara and I obtained, and this formula, which basically we obtained with Claus's methods. And I claim that those two things are equal. So in this case, it's kind of not obvious, I would say. Um, and so what we do here to prove that these are equal is we go back to this expression for zeta prime at zero. Kind of the idea is this here is sort of, you have this stuff, and then this is sort of integer e, okay? But this junk here does not look integer e. So we go back, to an expression that looks integer e, which is this, okay? And we do a lot of manipulations with this data function. So we, we've assumed the angle is pi over j for some integer j, and so we pop that in, okay? And then we split the sum over n into con, like the, the congruency classes, 
okay? And make these manipulations um, to express it in this form. And, oh, everybody knows this. Everybody knows this sum. We can all do that sum. So we use this uh, simple, simple fact to rewrite this whole big thing. And then we, you can see this has an actual splitting into one, two, three terms. We give them names. And this is actually the same name that's used in Gradstein and Rizik. So I'm just summing up what we've obtained here. And now we want to compute the derivative at s equals zero. So the first two, they're fine. You can just take the derivative at s equals zero. There's no, there's no singularity. It's aided by this little s in front. The last one is a bit dodgy. So in the first two, you just, you just calculate the derivative. This is what you get. Number three, we've got to expand it out. So we summarizing what we've obtained, okay, what's this guy? This psi is the derivative of the log of the gamma function. So basically, we do some more, you know, standard manipulations, and we use the fact that according to Gradstein and Rajik, this psi, this uh, derivative of the log of the gamma function kind of magically can be expressed in terms of cotangents and cosines and logs of sines. So seeing those logs of sines is like, oh, we're getting there, we're getting there. So then we just need to prove that these two quantities are equal. And that's just a bunch of calculations. And that's kind of how that works out. So um, I want to, now take a minute to, to say, what about when angles aren't of the form pi over an integer? Then we have this formula, okay, which is supposed to equal this other formula. So you can see what you want to have happen, and that is somehow we want to change this integral. We want to do that to kill this sum and to pick up terms that will equal these and have our integral change to look like this. So to do this, we, um, we prove a couple of lemmas. So the first one is what this integral of this mishmash of hyperbolic cosine and regular cosine is is equal to, and I'm sure you can guess how we do that. It's a contour integral, but it's, it's got a little finesse. So we start by defining a function that's kind of like what we're integrating, but with nine in front, and then we twiddle it around and obtain that our f is equal to a function h minus h is conjugate. And this h, okay, which is basically the product of g with this one over one plus cosh s, when you shift by two pi, you get the conjugate. So we can use that to do a fun contour integral calculation. And so we integrate along this contour by the usual arguments, the sides of the box 10 to zero. The top is going to kind of what we want as R goes to infinity. The bottom is giving us um, the conjugate of H. So it kind of adds up to what we need. And then since it's negatively oriented, it's um, this contour integral gives us minus two pi I times the sum of the residues at the poles. And so there's, there's simple poles, if we go back here, you can see when this vanishes, there's gonna be a nice simple pole, but this and that can both vanish at the same time. And that's gonna give us a third order pole right here at minus i pi. So that's really fun to compute, but we compute it all and that gives the result. 
<laughs> Next, um, we have that part with the log. So we compute that this integral is equal to this stuff. But you can see it's now looking like our other formula. So it's a similar kind of calculation. You define a particular choice of a function. You see that you want to integrate this function along the real line and then use another residue theorem calculation by integrating over contour. Since we have this log, you know, there's a branch cut, so we have to do a little hop. And basically how we end up with this stuff here, you can see this is the integral from zero to one, okay? And that's sort of coming from adding and subtracting the asymptotic expansion near this bad point, which allows us to send epsilon to zero and r to infinity, put everything together and obtain um, the result. And finally, when you put all of, all of those calculations together, this is equal to our other formula obtained by the other method. So, thank you. Thanks, uh, Julie, for the nice talk.